For over 50 episodes, Kiyaya and Daniel have been here sharing lots and lots of great books. We look forward to the next 50 episodes. Join us every day at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard for Let's Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiyaya and Daniel. Elizabeth and Maggie are back for another episode of Let's Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiyaya and Daniel, and they're back for our 51st episode as Thursdays, as, as forever, Thursdays and Fridays continue on Let's Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiyaya and Daniel. They will be reading chapters 22 to 24 today, and we are looking forward to it. Sit back, relax, let's get cozy. Are you a singer, an actor, an artist, a crocheter, a knitter, a cross-stitcher, a potter, are you a crafter? Coming soon to Rude Rangers TV is Crafty Conversations with... That's right. My outspoken friend Kiaya and I are going to be launching our new show on Rude Rangers TV this spring. Email us at craftyconversations at stitchingwolfdesigns.com if you're interested in sharing your story with us. Follow us on our social media accounts. Or check our website out, www.stitchingwolfdesigns.com. Or give us a call, 516-274-0350. The possibilities are endless. Stories are such an important part of our lives. Join my friend Kiaya and I for Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiaya and Daniel, where we share some of the greatest picture books and chapters from children's and young adult literature to inspire you to keep embedding literacy into your days. I'm Daniel, and Kiaya and I are here to share this all with you. Next morning, Winnie went out to the fence directly after breakfast. It was the hottest day yet, so heavy that the slightest exertion brought on a flood of perspiration and exhaustion in the joints. Two days before, they would have insisted that she stay indoors. But now, this morning, they were careful with her, a little gingerly, as if she were an egg. She had said, I'm going outside now. And they had said, all right, but come in if it gets too hot, won't you, dear? And she had answered, yes. The earth, where it was worn bald under the gate, was cracked and hard as a rock, a lifeless tan color. And the road was an aisle of brilliant velvet dust. Winnie leaned against the fence, her hands gripping the warm metal of the bars, and thought about May behind another set of bars in the jailhouse. And then lifting her head, she saw the toad. It was squatting where she had seen it first across the road. Hello, she said, very glad to see it. The toad did not so much as flick a muscle or blink an eye. It looked dried out today, parched. It's thirsty, said Winnie to herself. No wonder on a day like this. She left the fence and went back into the cottage. Granny, can I have some water in a dish? There's a toad out front that looks as if it's just about to die of thirst. A toad, said her grandmother, wrinkling her nose in disgust. Nasty things, toads. Not this one, said Winnie. This one is always out there and I like him. Can I give him a drink of water? Toads don't drink water, Winifred. It wouldn't do him any good. They don't drink water at all? No, they take it in through their skins like a sponge when it rains. But it hasn't rained in forever, said Winnie, alarmed. 
I couldn't sprinkle some water on him, couldn't I? That would help, wouldn't it? Well, I suppose so, said her grandmother. Where is he, in the yard? No, said Winnie, he's across the road. I'll come with you then. I don't want you leaving the yard alone. But when they came out to the fence, when he balancing a small bowl of water with enormous care, the toad was gone. Well, he must be all right, said her grandmother, if he could hop off. With mingled disappointment and relief, Winnie tipped the water onto the cracked earth at the gate. It was sucked in immediately, and the wet brown stain it left behind paled and vanished almost as quickly. I never saw such heat in all my life, said Winnie's grandmother, dabbing useless, uselessly at her neck with a handkerchief. Don't stay out here much longer. I won't, said Winnie, and was left alone once more. She sat down on the grass and sighed. May, what could she do to set May free? She closed her eyes against the glaring light and watched, a little dizzily, as brilliant patterns of red and orange danced inside her eyelids. And then, miraculously, Jessie was there, crouching just on the other side of the fence. Winnie, he hissed, you sleeping? Oh, Jessie! Her eyes flew open and she reached through the fence to grasp his hand. I'm so glad to see you. What can we do? We have to get her out. Miles got a plan, but I don't see how it can work, said Jesse, his voice almost a whisper. He knows a lot about carpentering. Says he can make Ma's window frame right out of the wall, bars and all, and she can climb through. I'm going to try it tonight when it gets dark. Only trouble is that constable keeps watching her every minute. He's so darn proud of having a prisoner in that new jail of his. We've been down to see her. She's all right. But even if she can climb through the window, he'll come after her as soon as she's gone. Seems to me he'll notice right off. That don't give us much time to get away, but we got to try it. There ain't no other way. Anyhow, I come to say goodbye. We won't be able to come back for a long, long time, Winnie, if we get away. I mean, they'll be looking for Ma. Winnie, listen. I won't see you again. Not for ages. Look now. Here's a bottle of water from the spring. You keep it. And then, no matter where you are, when you're 17, Winnie, you can drink it and then come find us. We'll leave direction somehow. Winnie, please say you will. He pressed the little bottle into her hands and Winnie took it, closing her fingers over. Jessie, wait, she whispered breathlessly, for all at once she had the answer. I can help. When your mother climbs out the window, I'll climb in and take her place. I can wrap myself up in her blanket and when the constable looks in, he won't be able to tell the difference. Not in the dark. I can hump up and look a lot bigger. Miles can even put the window back. That would give you time to get away. You'd have at least till morning. Jesse squinted at her and then he said, Yep, you know, it might work. It might just make the difference. But I don't know as Pa's going to want you taking any risk. I mean, what will they say to you after when they find out? I don't know, said Winnie, but it doesn't matter. Tell your father I want to help. I have to help. If it wasn't for me, there wouldn't have been any trouble in the first place. Tell him I have to. Well, all right. Can you get out after dark, said Winnie. Can you get out after dark? Yes, said Winnie. Then at midnight, Winnie, I'll be waiting for you right here at midnight. Winifred! An anxious voice called from the cottage. Who's that you're talking to? Winnie stood up and turned to answer. It's just a boy, Granny. I'll be in in a minute. When she turned around again, Jessie was gone. Winnie clutched the little bottle in her hands and tried to control the rising excitement that made her breath catch. At midnight, she would make a difference in the world. It was the longest day, mindlessly hot, unspeakably hot, too hot to move or even think. The countryside, the village of Tree Gap, the wood, 
all lay defeated. Nothing stirred. The sun was a ponderous circle without edges, a roar without a sound. A blazing glare so thorough and remorseless that even in the Foster's parlor with curtains drawn, it seemed an actual presence. You could not shut it out. Winnie's mother and grandmother sat plaintive all afternoon in the parlor, fanning themselves and sipping lemonade, their hair unsettled and their knees loose. It was totally unlike them. This lapse from gentility, it made them much more interesting. But Winnie didn't stay with them. Instead, she took her own brimming glass to her room and sat in her little rocker by the window. When she had hidden Jessie's bottle in the bureau drawer, there was nothing to do but wait. In the hall outside her room, the grandfather's clock ticked deliberately, unimpressed with anyone's impatience, and Winnie found herself rocking to its rhythm. Forward, back, forward, back, tick, tock, tick, tock. She tried to read, but it was so quiet that she could not concentrate. And so she was glad when at last it was time for supper. It was something to do, though none of them could manage more than a nibble. But later, when Winnie went out again to the fence, she saw that the sky was changing. It was not so much clouding up as thickening somehow. From every direction at once, the blank blue gone to haze. And then, as the sun sank reluctantly behind the treetops, the haze hardened to a brilliant brownish yellow. In the wood, the leaves turned underside up, giving the trees a silvery cast. The air was noticeably heavier. It pressed on Winnie's chest and made her breathing difficult. She turned and went back into the cottage. It's going to rain, I think, she told the prostrate group in the parlor, and the news was received with little moans of gratitude. Everyone went to bed early, closing windows firmly on their way. From outside, though, it was almost dark. Shreds of the hard brown-yellow light lingered on the rims of things, and there was a wind beginning. Small gusts that rattled the fence gate set the trees to rustling. The smell of rain hung sweet in the air. What a week this has been, said Winnie's grandmother. Well, thank the Lord it's almost over. And Winnie thought to herself, yes, it's almost over. There were three hours to wait before midnight and nothing whatever to do. Winnie wandered restlessly about her room, sat in her rocker, lay on her bed, counted the ticks of the hall clock. Beneath her excitement, she was thick with guilt. For the second time in three short days, though they seemed many more, she was about to do something which she knew would be forbidden. She didn't have to ask. Winnie had her own strong sense of rightness. She knew that she could always say afterward. Well, you never told me not to. But how silly would that be? Of course it would never occur to them to include such a thing on their list of don'ts. She could hear them saying it and almost smiled. Now remember, Winifred, don't bite your fingernails, don't interrupt when someone else is speaking, and don't go down to the jailhouse at midnight to change places with prisoners. Still, it wasn't really funny. What would happen in the morning when the constable found her in the cell and had to bring her home for the second time? What would they say? Would they ever trust her again? Winnie squirmed, sitting in the rocker, and swallowed uncomfortably. Well, she would have to make them understand, somehow, without explaining. The hall clock chimed eleven. Outside, the wind had stopped. Everything, it seemed, was waiting. Winnie laid down and closed her eyes, thinking of Tuck and May and Miles and Jessie. Her heart softened. They needed her. To take care of them. For in the funny sort of way that had struck her at the first, when they were helpless. Or too trusting. Well, something like that. Anyway, they needed her. She would not disappoint them. May would go free. No one would have to find out. Minnie would not. Winnie would not have to find out that May could not. But Winnie blocked the picture from her mind. The horror that would prove the secret. Instead, she turned her thoughts to Jessie. When she was seventeen, would she? If it was true, would she? And if she did. 
would she be sorry afterwards? Tuck had said, It's something you don't find out how you feel until afterwards. But no, it wasn't true. She knew that now, here in her own bedroom. They were probably crazy after all, but she loved them anyway. They needed her, and, thinking this, Winnie fell asleep. She woke with a jerk some time later and sat up. Alarmed. The clock was ticking steadily. The darkness was complete. Outside, the night seemed poised on tiptoe, waiting, waiting, holding its breath for the storm. Winnie stole out into the hall. Winnie stole out to the hall and frowned at the clock face in the shadows. And at last, she could make it out, for the black Roman numerals were just barely visible against their white ground. The brass hand glowed faintly. As she peered at them, the long hand snapped forward one more notch with a loud click. She had not missed her moment. It was five minutes to midnight. Leaving the house was so easy that Winnie felt faintly shocked. She had half expected that the instant she put a foot on the stairs, they would leap from their beds and surround her with accusations. But no one stirred, and she was struck by the realization that, if she chose, she could slip out night after night without their knowing. The thought made her feel more guilty than ever that she should once more take advantage of their trust. But tonight, this one last time, she had to. There was no other way. She opened the door and slipped out into the heavy August night. Leaving the cottage was like leaving something real and moving into a dream. Her body felt weightless and she seemed to float down the path to the gate. Jessie was there waiting. Neither of them spoke. He took her hand and they ran together, lightly down the road, past other sleeping cottages, into the dim and empty center of the village. The big glass windows here were lidded eyes that didn't care, that barely saw them, barely gave them back reflections. The blacksmith's shop, the mill, the church, the stores, so busy and alive in daylight, were hunched, deserted now, dark piles and shapes without a purpose or a meaning. And then ahead, Winnie saw the jailhouse, its new wood still unpainted, lamplight spilling through a window at the front. And there, in the clear yard behind it, like a great L upside down, was the gallows. The sky flashed white, but this time it wasn't heat lightning. For a few moments later, a low mumble, still far away, announced at last the coming storm. A fresh breeze lifted Winnie's hair, and from somewhere in the village behind them, a dog barked. Two shadows detached themselves from the gloom as Winnie and Jessie came up. Tuck pulled her to him and hugged her hard, and Miles squeezed her hand. No one said a word. Then the four of them crept to the back of the building. Here, too high for Winnie to see into, was a barred window through which, from the room in front, light glowed faintly. Winnie peered up at it, at the blackness of the bars with the, with the dim gold of the light in between. Into her head came lines from an old poem. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Over and over the lines repeated themselves in her head till they were altogether meaningless. Another roll of thunder sounded. The storm was moving nearer. Then Miles was standing on a box. He was pouring oil around the frame of the window. A swirl of wind brought the thick, rich smell of it down to Winnie's nostrils. Tuck handed up a tool, and Miles began to pry at the nails securing the window frame. Miles knew carpentering. Miles could do the job. Winnie shivered and held tight to Jessie's hand. One nail was free. Another. Tuck reached up to receive them as they came out one by one. A fourth nail screeched as it was pried up, and Miles poured more oil. From the front of the jailhouse, the constable yawned noisily and began to whistle. The whistling came nearer. Miles dropped down. They heard the constable's footsteps coming up to May's cell. The barred door clanked. Then the footsteps receded. The whistling grew fainter 
an inner door shut and the lamp glow disappeared. At once, Miles was up again and prying at the nails. An eighth was out, a ninth, a tenth. Winnie counted carefully while behind her counting, her mind sang, stone walls do not a prison make. Miles handed down the prying tool. He grasped the bars of the window firmly, ready to pull, and stood poised. What is he waiting for, thought Winnie. Why doesn't he? Then a flash of lightning and soon after a crack of thunder. In the midst of the noise, in the midst of the noise, Miles gave a mighty heave, but the window did not budge. The thunder ebbed. Winnie's heart sank. What if it was all impossible? What if the window would never come out? What if she looked over her shoulder at the dark shape of the gallows and shuddered? Again, a flash of night of lightning, and this time a crashing burst of noise from the swirling sky. Miles yanked. The window frame sprang free, and still, grasping it by the bars, he tumbled backward off the box. The job was done. Two arms appeared in the hole left by the missing frame. Nay! Her head appeared. It was too dark to see her face. The window, what if it was too small for her to squeeze through? What if... But now her shoulders were out. She groaned softly. Another flash of lightning lit her face for an instant, and Winnie saw an expression there of deep concentration. Tip of tongue protruding, brows furrowed. Now Tuck was on the box, helping her, giving her his own shoulder to pull on. Miles and Jesse close at his sides, arms upstretched, eager to receive her bulk. Her hips were free now. Look out! Here she came, her skirts tearing on rough edges of the boards, arms flailing, and they were all in a heap on the ground. Another crash of thunder muffled Jesse's bursting, exultant laugh. May was free. Winnie clasped her trembling hands, thankfully. And then the first drop of rain plopped precisely on the tip of her nose. The tucks untangled themselves and turned to her. One by one, as the rain began, they drew her to them and kissed her. One by one, she kissed them back. Was it rain on May's face? Or tucks? Or was it just tears? Jesse was last. He put his arms around her and hugged her tight and whispered the single word, Remember. Then Miles was on the box again lifting her. Her hands grasped the edges of the window. This time she waited with him. When the thunder came, it tore the sky apart with its roar, and as it came, she pulled herself through and dropped to the cot inside, unharmed. She looked up at the open square and saw the frame with Miles's hand holding it. The next... A blinging roll of thunder saw it wedge once more into place, and then, would Miles put back the nails? She waited. Rain came in sheets now, riding the wind, flung crosswise through the night. Lightning crackled, a brilliant jagged streak, and thunder rattled the little building. The tension in the parched earth eased and vanished. Winnie felt it go. The muscles of her stomach loosened, and all at once she was exhausted. Still she waited. Would Miles put back the nails? At last, standing tiptoe on the cot, she grasped the bars of the window, pulling herself up till she could just see through. Rain blew into her face, but at the next flash of lightning, looking down, she saw that the yard was empty. And before the thunder followed in a pause while the wind and rain held back for one brief moment, she thought she heard, fading in the distance, the tinkling melody of the music box. The tucks, her darling tucks, were gone. Maggie and Elizabeth, phenomenal reading. I love being able to share all this with you and to share our 50th episode and 51st episode with you. Come back next week when Forever Thursdays and Fridays continue with Everlasting on Let's Get Cozy, because it's story time with Kiyaya and Daniel.